Okay. Okay, let's get started. Happy Friday. We need to finish up uh, the calculations bit of reagents and buffers and start chromatography. So, and then on uh, next week, please pay attention. Next week, Monday and Wednesday, Gary will be here lecturing the GC part. So I moved him up a little bit because I would, I'm not going to be here Monday and Wednesday. Um, so I'll finish up the calculations, pull up that sheet for extra credit. I found out that it's for plus five, not plus two. So make sure you have all your calculations over the past couple of lectures. And at the end of the buffer calculation, at the end of today's lecture, turn it in for your extra plus five. Reminder, you have an additional extra credit opportunity at plus five as well for the sampling and sample preparation lecture. At the end, there was a question for you to solve. It's not required, but it's extra credit. And bring it here on Monday. Uh, Jean or Nigel will collect it from you um, because I'm not, not going to be. All right, so pull that piece of paper back up. And uh, the next uh, section in this part of the agents and buffer, I'm gonna talk a little bit about buffers. Uh, so buffers uh, consist of the weak acid and the conjugate phase. And they catalyze a certain pH to keep the pH stable during a reaction, especially when you have a chemical reaction that might change the pH. And if the pH changes, then potentially the activity will change, dissociation factors will change. So the buffers work in maintaining that pH constant. Um, so it occurs when we have, like I said, a weak acid and it's got a bonding conjugate base. And the and I'm sure you've seen the Henderson Hasselbalch equation before. And it shows the relationship between pH, pKa, and the concentration of conjugate base and the acid, the non-dissociated acid. So the dissociated acid, that means when the acid loses its proton, it becomes a conjugate base. And when the acid holds on to its proton, it's actually your acid. So acid and conjugate base. Um, so what is the pKa? What's the definition of pKa? You remember from your gen chemistry, from anywhere else that does it mean to you? The dissociation constant. Not you're not refresh. Priyanshi. What did I call it? Refresh. It's not here. Okay. Priyanshi. Yeah. The dissociation constant. It's the what? It's the dissociation constant. The dissociation constant is the pKa. PKA is actually the pH. At which the concentration of conjugate base equal the concentration of acid. So log of one is zero. So when the pH is equal pKa, that means the dissociated acid and the non-dissociated acid, the concentration is equal. This is where you have maximum buffering capacity. When the pH equal the pKa, you have maximum buffering capacity. So if you're titrating with an acid, the conjugate base is going to pick up the protons and resist the drop in 
pH. If you have calculating with a base, the acid is going to dominate the proton and resist the rise in the pH. So therefore, you have the maximum buffering capacity with the concentration of carbonate base equal the concentration of the uh, acid. So log of one is zero. pH equals the base. These are important uh, facts to remember. So when we produce a buffer, we need to know what is the pH that we want for that buffer. What's the, what is the pKa of the acid that we are using to prepare the buffer? And if we know this, we can produce the buffer using the acid and its conjugate base. So here you want to apply the equation of H equal pKa plus log of the concentration of conjugate uh, base over your acid, concentration of the acid. So this is the equation that is going to determine how much conjugate base I need and how much acid I need to put them together to generate a, a buffer solution at a particular pH. So here, the, the question is asking you, you need to prepare one liter. So the given is one liter of buffer that is a one molar concentration. So these are given, you have, you have one liter that you want to prepare. You want to prepare a one molar concentration of a buffer at pH 4.6. So this is another given, you have the pH, you want one liter, you want it to have a total concentration of one molar, you want a pH of 4.6. And another given, I gave you the dissociation factor of 1.74 times 10 to the negative 5 of the acidic acid. To get the pKa on your calculator, you need to use negative log Ka to get the pKa. So who has a scientific or a calculator that can give us the pKa? So what's the pKa of the acetic acid? Just use your calculator, negative log Ka. Ah. Uh, 4.76. Okay. So you have all this given. Another thing that you have given, you should know that the concentration of the conjugate base and the acid should be one molar. The volume, if I want to do this in volume, one thousand milliliters. Okay. All right. Now try to solve this. You have all of the given and the equation. And you also have a solution that has three molar acetic acid. And then you have an acetate powder, which is the conjugate base with a molecular weight of 82 grams per mole. So you have three molar. Acetic acid and you have a powder of sodium acetate. 
as you say, molecular weight equals 82 grams per mole. Okay. Think about it. Based on the given and the equations we practiced in the past couple of lectures. So the first thing you want to do is get the ratio of this concentration using the equation, right? You have the pH, you have the pKa, and then you determine the log of this, and then you get the ratio of conjugate to H. And then what you can do, you have one molar, this plus this equal one molar. Let's say you want to solve for AH or you want to solve for conjugate base. You can replace this by one minus concentration of conjugate base. Then you will be solving for the one unknown in the equation. So if this equals, if I want to say, H A equal one minus A minus because this is one molar. Then I can put replace here with that. Then you can solve for the concentration of conjugate base, and then you subtract it from one, you get the concentration of the acid. Who has gone that far? Mm -hmm. You have the pH, you have the pKa, you can substitute HA with one minus A because your given is one molar. So this plus this equal one molar, the concentration of base plus concentration of acid equal one molar. You got it, Ed? Uh, yeah, I got concentrations and just not sure what to do after. Yes, that's good. That's a good start. What did you get for concentration of A minus? Uh, I got 0. 0.41 molar. 0. 0.41 molar. Let me see if that's the concentration I got. Okay, I uh, you rounded a little bit, so I want to keep it not rounded. Okay, and your H A do not round. Uh, that would be 0 0.592. Zero point five nine two more. So basically, what we did, we put the given. You have a four point six pH. The pKa is 4.76 plus log of conjugate base. And since we know that the concentration of conjugate base plus the concentration of acid equal one molar, because that's the molarity, that's the concentration I want in the end. So I want to combine the acid with its base to give me a concentration of one molar, then I can substitute the acid and I say one minus, so that's one molar minus HA, sorry, minus A, conjugate. 
base. Okay, do we all know where the one minus concentration of conjugate base came from? If you don't know, this is the time to ask. I'm happy to repeat. Okay. So we all know where the one molar minus conjugate base came from. Then I solve this equation to get the concentration of A minus. So basically I would have minus 0 0.16, correct? Equal log of All right, so what would be the inverse log? So what would be A minus on your calculator? One molar minus, what would that value be? 0 0.692. 0 0.692, yeah. All right, just making sure I got Yep. Okay. Do you all know how to use your calculator to get the inverse log, right? Okay. If you don't know, ask a friend. <laughs> and then what you would do is you just solve for X, basically. Then you go here, A minus equals 0.692. Minus zero point six nine two, and then one point six nine two A equal point six nine two, and then your concentration point six nine two over one point six nine two, and then should give you 0 0.408 molar because this is the, the unit is molarity. Okay, any place here? Well, you can't see in the back or any questions before we move on to what do we do next? Yes, yes, I see. What did we do to get rid of the log again? Well, in your calculator, you need to get the negative. Yeah, 10 yeah. to the power of one. Uh, yeah. Okay. And any other questions? Can we move forward from here? We good? All right. So I have this concentration now. I need 0 0.408 molar of conjugate base. Okay, so what do I have? I have three molar of this. What would be the volume that I would take? So I need, I have three molar of, oh, sorry. Uh, conjugate base is sodium acetate, not the acid. Okay. So I need to prepare 0 0.408 molar, which is 0 0.408 moles per liter. This is what I want. My final volume is a liter. I want to get 0 0.048 moles per liter. I have only the molecular weight of a powder. Then, I remember that number of moles equals mass over molecular weight grams per mole. Right. I have the molecular weight. I have this in powder form. Then what I need to do is I need to get how much do I need to get of sodium acetate so I get 0 0.408 mole per liter. So basically, point. 0.408 moles equal the x I'm solving for how much I need to weigh out of the sodium acetate, which is my conjugate base. 
over 82 grams per mole. Okay, so what I need then is 82 grams per mole times 0 0.408 moles equals, so mole here and mole here cancel. What is that? 82 times 0 0.408. 33 33.456. 33. 33.4. I'm going to round it to 4.6. Okay, grams. So I'm going to weigh this much amount for my buffer. Now, how much I need of my acetic acid? So it's 0.592 molar. So I need 0.592 molar. And I need to prepare one liter of the buffer. And I have three molar. How much do I need in milliliter from my stock solution? So I'm doing, remember, concentration times volume equal concentration times volume. That is it. Okay, so now I'm solving for X. So point. Five nine two molar. I'm just going to convert this to 1000 milliliters so that I have equate uh, units. I divide by three molar. I get I need 500. No, what's 592 divided by three? 197 milliliters. Okay, so now I get my one liter of volumetric flask. I will put in my 33.4 grams. Usually, I the way I do it actually in the lab, I would weigh this amount in a beaker dissolve it in some like 200 milliliters water or something, 200 milliliters, 500 milliliters. Just, I prepare it separately in a beaker and then I put it here. And then I add my conjugate base, 197 milliliters. And then I make up to one liter with EDW. Okay, so just to repeat to catch for somebody to catch up with this. Um, I started off with my conjugate base. What I did is I had a powder, so I needed to determine how much I need to weigh out of this powder in order to get 0 .04, 0 0.048 more which is 0 0.408 mole per liter. I know that number of moles equals mass over molecular weight. I have the molecular weight. I have the number of moles in the meter. I can get the weight. So now I know I need 33.46 grams of this, acid, of this sodium acetate. I prepare it in a small amount of water and then I put it in a one liter volumetric flask. And then I go to see, okay, how much I need of my acid. I have a three milliliter stock solution. I know I want 0.592 molar of the acid. And the final volume is a liter or a thousand milliliter. I have a three amount. How much do I need? Sorry, three molar. How much do I need of that three molar? I calculate that I need 197 milliliter. I add it to my volumetric flask. I make up to a liter with water. Any questions? You'll be doing this in lab next week. There, there are different ways of calculation. 
And sometimes we give you different stock solutions for different concentrations, but basically you want to know the Nash and Hasselbach equation. You want to know your normality or molality in relation to a liter, number of moles, the equation, and CV equals CV. You, you should be able to solve systematically your uh, Yes. At the end, yeah. Okay, so you got that we need 197 milliliters. You got that we need 33.46. Okay, since it's a powder, usually in a lab, you don't put the powder directly in a volumetric flask. You just bring a small beaker, 250 milliliter beaker. You weigh either on a weighing paper or directly in your beaker. You weigh that amount of your base and you put it in the beaker, you add some water, 200, 950, whatever, and put the stir bottle. You solubilize your base and then you just put it in the volumetric glass. Now you have what you need of your base. And then you go, okay, I need 197 of my acid. And I add it to the flask. Then I make up for the volume, which is what we get in this case. At the end, you measure the pH to make sure that you have the pH that you are after, which is 4.6. If the pH is a little off, you adjust by adding a little bit of acid or a little bit. Okay, any other questions on this calculation? There is another way of calculating, which I will share with you as well. Okay. I'm going to keep this value. This is all. So, okay. All right. Another way of doing this, which is actually for me, is my. My preferred way, because to me it's easier. I don't know where I put the cover. Uh, yeah. All right. So you pick whatever way you want that you uh, relate with better. Okay, so I said I want one molar solution. I can go and look at what I have. I have acidic acid and I have sodium acetate. I can go ahead and prepare one molar of each. So I go and say, okay, I'm gonna prepare a liter of one molar acidic acid. So I'm just gonna say, oh. X milliliters and I want one molar of 1000 milliliters. Okay. So I said, okay, I need a one molar, uh, concentration of a final buffer. So I'm gonna prepare one molar of acetic acid. So I solve for X. So this is 1,000 molarity here cancel. Okay, so this is 1,000 millimeter over um, three. So that's 300. 33.33 milliliters. So I take from my stock solution 333.33 milliliters and I prepare a one molar acetic acid. Okay, so I have this other this dilution to get one molar of acetic acid. Okay, I want to prepare one molar of sodium acetate. So one molar 
for one mole per one liter. So equals my mass 82 grams. No, sorry. X. I'm looking for the mass. Mass in grams over 82 grams per mole, which is your molecular weight. And I have one molar. <coughs> so basically, I need to weigh 82 grams in one meter. Okay? So moles, that's moles per meter. So mole and mole cancel. So I need to weigh 82 grams in a meter to get one molar solution. Okay, so I prepared another polymetric flask, one molar using my 82 grams in water. Okay, now I have one molar of this and one molar of that. I need to prepare one liter of my final buffer. So then I will say X to the liter of A minus plus X to the liter of HA, I'm going to consider that as my amount, equals 1,000 milliliters. So I need to find out how many milliliters of, the, of these two solutions are prepared. How many milliliters of the base, how many milliliters of the acid. Now they are at the same concentration to prepare one liter of my bottle. Okay, so I have this X, this amount of A minus plus this amount equals a thousand. If I want to determine the H A, and here I'm talking the, the uh, unit is milliliter, it would be 1000 milliliter minus Minus the amount of conjugate base in me. Then I can go here. So this equation, which is 0 0.692, and then I go, I'm solving for A minus, but instead of the one molar, now I put 1000 milliliters minus the A minus. So I'm solving for A minus in milliliter in volume. So let's do that. So then I'll have 692 milliliters minus 0.692 A minus equal A minus. So then I have 692 milliliters equal 1.692. A minus, and can you solve now for A minus how many milliliters? So it would be 692 over 1.692 in milliliters. What do I get? Point huh? Point 0.692 divided by 1.692. Four oh eight. Wait, four oh nine. Four. four oh eight milliliters. Four oh eight milliliters, and then a thousand minus four oh eight milliliter is five nine two milliliters. So I need five nine two milliliters and four oh eight milliliters that I add to produce my one liter buffer. From I take this from the unified one milliliter, one molar of each. So it's up to you. You can produce the one molar of each and then solve for the volume using the same equation, or you solve for concentration and then prepare the final buffer using the amount of moles for each. The agent. I don't know where the cover is. I lost. Any question? 
Okay, you'll have more practice in lab next week. Uh, just make sure that you take pictures of whatever you turn in today for me. If you turn in multiple pages, make sure you have your name on all of the pages. Yes. And at the end of the lecture, just uh, put it up here for me. I know. If you want to take a picture of this, you can. I'll, let, I'll allow you to see this if you want to take a picture of it. And then there is this other way of solving it. Preparing the one molar of each and then solving for the volume. If you want to take a picture of that, feel free to do so. Okay, one way or the other, make sure you have the solution for these two, uh, two ways of solving the buffer because your pre-lab quiz have some calculations and the pre-lab quiz already posted for you so that over the weekend you want to practice and solve so that you're ready for lab. In lab, you're going to prepare several reagents, some of which will be used in later labs. So you will learn how to prepare a concentrated or a saturated salt solution. A point one normal, the concentrated salt solution will be used in the GC lab. Uh, to saturate fatty acids while you are preparing fatty acids for, uh, for um, fatty acid composition. You will be preparing caffeine standards for when you determine caffeine in your HPLC lab. And you will be preparing a 0.1 normal HCL solution that we will standardize and use in your protein lab. And then you'll prepare a buffer. We won't use it in any labs, but you will learn how to do the calculation and prepare a buffer and measure the pH. So you'll learn how to use a pH meter. So this is a very good introductory lab for utilizing your skills and preparing the agents. And you see what happens behind the scenes when our TAs prepare the agents for you to carry on the labs. Okay, so I want to start a, a new topic, my favorite topic, not necessarily of all times, but one of my favorite topics, chromatography. All right, we don't have a lot of time uh, today. I wanted to introduce the topic a little bit, at least before you learn about gas chromatography with Gary, but we'll just do as much as we can in the last 13 minutes. All right, chromatography. What does it mean to you when you hear chromatography? What is it? What is this tool? What does it do? I'm sure you have learned about it somewhere, but what does it mean to you? What do we do or what are we asking when we run chromatography? What are we trying to do? One word. We can define it in one word. Perfect. That's that happens after the one word that I'm looking at. Jason. <clears throat> What's that? I didn't hear it. Is that feasible for a picture? Feasible? Feasible. Oh, oh feasible. feasible. What oh, is that? The I asked you a visual. Visual. Oh, okay. Chroma from color. I know where you're going, but that's not the word I'm looking for. What does it do, chromatography? What does it help us with? What is that? 
Well, I think it's the spectrum, like the prism. Well, like light uh, is going and splitting. Splitting. Splitting light. Good. We are splitting. I guess I'm using gas channel because I'm not getting the word separating. Separation. That's what I'm looking for. We are separating components from each other so we can detect them, identify them, quantitate them. So chromatography is a technique that allows separation. And the separation happens due to affinity of different compounds to different phases we use in chromatography. Okay, so we have two phases. We're going to talk about them a lot. The stationary phase, that's the move, and the mobile phase. Okay, so the separation happens on the stationary phase, and the mobile phase carry the components that get separated. So one gets separated first, moves on faster, and the other follows. They get separated from each other and get separated. Okay, I'm going to give you a life um, example to understand chromatography. So when my daughter was little, now she's not little and she hates this example. Um, so when she was like between nine and 12, she's 20 now, she's close to 11. So we used to go to the mall. There used to be a store called Justice. <laughs> yes. Okay, and no longer, it's no longer in the mall. I think Miles brought role for the issue to kind of <laughs> So we go to this justice. It's full of pink and purple and stuff and shiny and glitter and so much disturption to my eyes. <laughs> so we go in and then we soon get separated because I'm ready to leave. So I'm very close to the door while she goes in and interacts with everything in the store. And she takes her time. She has strong affinity to everything in the store. And I'm like, no, I'm done. I'm leaving. And then she, she won't come. She would not come along. So I come as a mobile face. What do I do to push her out is I buy something. So I buy one of the things that she got attracted to, she carries it with her and leaves the store. And that's how we, we work in chromatography. Some compounds don't associate with the column. The others associate longer with the stationary phase. And for order for the multi phase to pull that out of that stationary phase, you increase the strength of the mobile phase. You put a toy, or a t-shirt or something for that kid to just, okay, leave the store, carry that toy, that shirt, and come out of the store and gets detected. And that's basically kind of, you have multiple components, even each have different affinity to that particular stationary phase. And the mobile phase job is to help them come out of that stationary phase and get detected at different time points. And that's good. And this helps us in so many ways to identify, to quantitate, to separate components and concentrate, and to concentrate them and then do different analysis. So throughout the semester, you're going to learn about so many techniques that involve chromatography, whether from um, fatty acid analysis, which you will do in the lab in a couple of weeks, where we take the lipid, we saponify it. So you know that triglycerides is you have glycerol and free fatty acid, you break them, you convert the fatty acid to a methyl ester so that it becomes volatile, then it can move through gas chromatography, get separated, you identify, you quantify, and you can determine fatty acid composition. We use that in amino acid composition using the curve chromatography, not gas chromatography. We use the chromatography in uh, vitamins analysis, for example. We use chromatography in protein analysis. We use it in pigment analysis. We use it in so many different examples in contaminants of concern. You will see chromatography for carbohydrate analysis as well. So we will learn it and then apply it throughout the semester. Okay. So the key for separation is interaction with your stationary. If you don't have interaction, you don't have affinity, 
So now my daughter is 20 years old. If we go into justice together, we're going to leave together. We're not going to be separated because she won't want anything um, to do with that story anymore. So we cannot be separated. If you want to separate us, you'll have to create this pecuniary phase where there is a different activity. So basically, compounds are going to interact with this pecuniary phase to separate. If we don't separate them, we can detect their separately. They're going to call elute. Elute meaning leave the column. They are, they're going to leave together and we won't have a successful separation. We won't have successful identification. So there is interaction that happens. Um, and there are different types of chromatography. Adsorption chromatography is a type where you have interaction via what? Do you have any idea? Do you have any guess with adsorption chromatography? The compounds are absorbing on your stationary phase, the phase that doesn't move. Does it do they interact via electrostatic, hydrogen, hydrophobic interaction? All of the above, none of the above. Wild guess. When you don't know, you go for all of them. So it's all of the above, and we're gonna learn about that. We're gonna learn about normal phase chromatography, and we're gonna learn about reverse phase chromatography. And the only reason it's called reverse phase because normal phase was was established first, and they figured out that they can do the same type of type of chromatography by switching the a stationary phase and the mobile phase, so they're opposite. So it's called reverse phase because they started with normal phase, and we're going to learn what normal phase means. And in reverse phase, polar compounds elute first. That is correct. And the mobile phase is polar liquid, and that is correct. So the answer for this is A and C. We're going to learn that in reverse phase chromatography, which is a chromatography we be used for caffeine analysis, not next week, the week after, some of you will be doing HPLT. So your stationary phase is nonpolar, and your mobile phase stops polar. So you have a polar mobile phase and you have a non-polar mobile phase. So the compounds that are more polar are would like to move fast and move with the polar phase. And the non-polar compounds would interact longer with your stationary phase. So polar compounds will do it first. So the only way to get nonpolar compounds out is by increasing the strength of your mobile. So you start with polar, then gradually increase um, organic solvent that is nonpolar. You increase the concentration of the organic solvent in your moving phase, which is the mobile phase. Then those less polar compounds will start to move more quickly down the column and get come out of the column, go to the detector and get back. So we will learn about all of these concepts bit by bit. This is just an introduction. So yes, what is the answer? A and C. Yeah. So, so that because you have a reverse phase, you have non-polar stationary phase and you have a polar mobile phase, then the polar compounds will go faster. But don't worry, we'll talk about all of these principles in more detail later on, uh, possibly after your GC lectures with Gary. Just in the last couple of minutes, a little bit of history, how chromatography started in the eight, late 1800s, early 1900s. There was a scientist, uh, a geologist, David Dale, he, he was the first to try to separate uh, petroleum use, using fuller earth. So he separated different components without really giving the, the uh, tool a name. Didn't call it anything, uh, but he figured out that if he uses fuller earth, he will be able to separate different petroleum into different uh, compounds. Later on, a Russian botanist, 
in early 1900s, Mikhail Zwick, he used a packed column with chalk and he ran leaf pigments and he saw the colors separating. And he saw different colors and that's when he called this principle or phenomenon chromatography, chroma from color. So that's where the name came from. And he was the one that was credited for the discovery of chromatography. So in the 40s, 1940s, we started seeing partition chromatography and paper chromatography. So we'll talk about that later on. What's partition chromatography usually is from the name, it's the partitioning of compounds between two liquid solvents. So both of your mobile, your mobile phase and the stationary phase are liquid. And a solute is partitioning or dividing between the moving solvent and the stationary solvent. And paper chromatography was also uh, developed and we'll talk about it as a planar chromatography. Planar, so it's not the column. So you have column chromatography and you have planar. In the 1960s, gas chromatography evolved due to petroleum industry. So then we had gas chromatography has evolved much sooner than liquid chromatography, but liquid chromatography uh, caught up and became very popular. And there's also and something in between we call superlytical fluid chromatography, and we'll talk about that as well later on. And with that, I'm going to leave you, and then Gary's going to talk a lot about gas chromatography. And next Friday, I'll be back here, hopefully, uh, ready to continue with liquid chromatography basics. All right, ask a lot of questions of Gary. Gary uh, always thinks that GC is better than LC, but don't let him convince you that way. I'll come back to convince you that LC is great as well. All right. Well, have a great weekend. I'll see you next Friday. Be here in class on Monday for Gary. Okay. Yeah.